Hello, everyone. My name is Julie McVeigh, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we talk about extraordinary experiences with everyday people. And today we are speaking with Daniela LeBlanc. Welcome. Hi, Julie. Hi. Welcome to the program. So I was hoping maybe you could just share a little bit of your background, just a little bit about yourself. Oh, my. Well, um, I'm originally from Germany. I grew up in East Germany. And at the age of 20, I decided to come and experience the United States and um, felt called to uh, build my life here after meeting my husband. And, well, that was a very long time ago. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I worked for almost 20 years in a corporate world and then decided to go out and um, start my own business. Well, I had already started it, but go full-time in my own business. I work with horses. I provide massage and body work therapy as well as energy work. And um, then I started a second business, which is an apothecary business and you know, got involved in the metaphysical community over the years. I've always been very sensitive, especially uh, working with animals. I've always had an affinity for animals and nature. And so it just kind of uh, grew from there. Okay, that's quite quite a, an interesting <laughs> life you're leading. Um, so when you were, did you learn about or get involved with animals and nature from a very young age? Was that just a natural? Well, I, I grew up in a very small village and we always had animals. So I was always okay. surrounded by animals. I was always drawn to animals. I had cats riding on my shoulders and my head. And, wow. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I mean, it just, uh, I think it really took a turn into a very serious uh, obsession when I uh, purchased my first horse and mm. And uh, I've never looked back. So. <laughs> and how old were you then? I was 32 when I purchased oh. my first horse. I, I was a late bloomer when I came to horses. I used to be terribly afraid of them. Wow. And uh, at 32, I decided to overcome my fear and took riding lessons. And five months later, I owned a horse. Or more wow. importantly, my horse, my horse owned me. <laughs> So, well, that's pretty yeah. cool. Um, yeah, horses. Uh, my his, my sister had horses while we were growing up, and they're just yeah. I mean, something very special and uh, spiritual, actually, and beautiful about yes. them. So, um, so yeah, I'd love to hear when did this turn? Um, when did you say it turned more metaphysical? I mean, to be. Uh, attracted to animals and have them attracted to our energy is one thing, but when you start picking up on it and realizing, oh, this is beyond, I guess, the natural in a sense, I don't know if you'd describe it that way, but when was the first time you started having some experiences? I would say my very first experience that really um, I can remember outside of just being um, sensitive, was when I was 13 and my father had died in a motorcycle accident that morning, early morning, and none of us knew about it at that time. So we went to school and suddenly I was being called out of class and my teacher said, your grandparents are here for you. And I just knew, I knew when he had passed. Wow. I, I, I couldn't have told you why, I just knew. I didn't have a vision. I, I, I am, um, I have a deep inner knowing. I don't get visions necessarily, although I do see spirits um, here and there. Um, and I don't necessarily hear things. I just know or I get messages um, just dumped into my brain, if that's a, a that might be a good way to describe it. But um, I, I just have a deep deep inner knowing and that's what happened and I was 13 at that time and I, I knew it was something out of the ordinary I just couldn't have described to you how I knew that 
but yeah, it was just. Um, I, was I think that's, I don't know, I could be wrong because I'm still learning Claire sent, sentience, yes. maybe? Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Um, and then uh, how about any of your siblings? Did they have similar giftings, if you will? Um, I, I think my brother is very sensitive to animals and things, but I wouldn't say that any of them have the development of that. I also have a sister and um, I think all of us have the ability to be tuned into different uh, ways in the world, the, the universe, the energies. It's just, are we developing them? Are we listening? Are we paying attention? And um, I'm not sure that my siblings necessarily went down that road. Mm. Um, we, don't really, we don't really talk too much about that because they live oh. in Germany and I live here. And so when we talk, it's all about family. Oh, and no one followed you. <laughs> things like that. No, no I'm the only crazy one. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it was a good choice. And um so then how did you get more involved and start, did you start developing these skills naturally? Did you take classes? I developed different skills when it came to working with horses or learning how to uh, work with plants. And I think I'm not sure that there really was a jumping off point where I decided this is metaphysical. It's just I'm a person who has always kept a very open mind to the things we cannot see, hear, taste. Um, and so for me, it was I, I just kept building and being exposed to different ways of thinking or looking at the world and so it just grew from there and then I had some incredible mentors who would they caused me to look at things in a different way and so it's just it was just a slow steady development of my own own skill set and the way I look at the world. How can you share some of the experiences that you've had um, mm. be related to your work or even maybe just your personal life, um, either working with energy or, you know, maybe when you've you have been able to see into the spirit world and you said you've seen spirits because that's quite fascinating as well. Yeah, so in my home life, um, I. I am owned by cats. <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, we had we had two kitties who have since passed, Charlie and Jerry. And once in a while, we will see them in our home. It's just out of the corner of your eye. Um, but they had a very distinct way of being, and so you know who is who. And even my husband sees them. So uh, my father-in-law spent some time in our home after he passed. Um, to help my husband through um, some situations. And uh, I would sense them, but I wouldn't necessarily see them. Uh, but I think the, the, the most drastic way in my work was expressed when I worked on an older mare and she had been retired. She had been a competition horse. And I had been called to work work on a different horse in, it was a private barn, a private residence. I had been called to work on a different horse and she just kept looking at me. This mare kept looking at me. And so I finally asked the owner if I could go over there because I got that very strong sense that she wanted to um, be touched by me. And so I went over there and I put my hands on her and suddenly I burst into this, this, this uncontrollable sobbing. It was just, I had touched her head. And the message I got clearly was that she felt she had let her owner down by, by not being able to compete any longer, that she felt uh, her retirement was just, it, it just broke her heart. So I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, um, because it, it leaves, 
it leaves almost um, the imp the impression was so strong that I've never forgotten that experience. So <laughs> the owner, I the owner suddenly looks at me and I'm like standing there next to a horse, just bawling my eyes out. And after I got myself together again, I I said I'm really sorry, but this is what happened. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure she was quite ready for that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> for that experience. But once in a while, uh, not every time, but once in a while, I will get impressions of how an injury occurred, or um, especially if it's an older traumatic injury or situation, I will, I will see pictures in my head. Um, and this is just with horses or all animals or different animals no I can get it from all animals um and sometimes it's not so much a picture but it's almost like I'm there and I'm experiencing it in like little flashes hmm. like there's just this knowing this is what happened um and and that's become stronger over time as I develop my own skills as I get more senses uh, that I work with it, it just it just you, you develop a stronger sense of those um of those things and you develop stronger abilities. So, you know, it's, it's just been, yeah, it becomes more frequent when those things happen. But. What is the name of the, the company or your business? My, my horse uh, bodywork business is called Healing Hands Equine Bodywork. Okay. And uh, yeah. Do you often, uh, so can you, if you wouldn't mind, just, just kind of describe what what a what it that looks like your work on a generally on a regular basis on a regular basis so most of my clients are there on a monthly program and so I see the horses regularly um when I first get to the barn I always ask permission when I when I mm first walk into the stall or the space where I work with the horse I always ask permission for touching um some horses I have a couple in my practice you can't touch them especially in the beginning they're um it's over if it overwhelms them because I'm asking them to tune into things that they have blocked or don't want to deal with and that's a very typical survival mechanism especially for prey animals um, so I established that connection, that energetic and physical connection, and then I typically will establish what's called continuity throughout the body. It's kind of like clearing the traffic blocks on the big highways. And once I do that, um, then I will dial more into specific areas and rebalance the body, mind, and emotions for these animals. And it doesn't matter if it's a horse, a cat, a dog, a, you know, I've worked with donkeys, I've <laughs> worked with pot belly pigs. <laughs> so, um, but that's, that's pretty much any this, this session, if I work regularly on a horse, um, will last from about an hour to an hour and a half, so. And I will, some horses, I will work with them in their stalls. Others are more settled when they're what's called cross ties, when they're just, you know, when they have ties that keep place on their halter. Um, it really depends on the horse. You know, when you first learn anything, you follow the rule, you follow the set of guidelines. And then once you start working, you learn how to work with the animal, the specific animal, and just allow them to find ways to work with you in the best way possible. The, the, main, the main point is that you always want to stay under the bracing response of the animal that you're working with. And by bracing res response, I don't mean just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. Hmm. Because when they allow you to connect with them emotionally, mentally, you have a much bigger chance of affecting their physical body in a in a beneficial way so it's very important that the animal establishes 
trust and um, and calmness and will allow you to, you know, really ask them to release patterns that may be tied to painful or traumatic experiences. These are, um, do you work with them, you said, on, on a monthly basis? Um, almost sounds like a therapist. And is this, is there a time where they graduate and they aren't needing these services? Do you teach, and also another question, do you teach the owner, you know, some, some abilities to how to have these better connections to help their, their horse? You know, some, um, some animals I'm called for specific reasons and, um, most of them have ongoing programs because it's an ongoing problem or they have, you know, they're being ridden uh, regularly. So, you know, being worked and, and, and being athletic always has some impact on their body if they're in training programs. Um, Sometimes I'm called out for just, you know, hey, I want to make my horse feel good. And then those are one offs. Um, mm -hmm. And the owner, it really depends. Some of them want to know more and I will show them different things on how they can help in the interim. Others, they're like, no, we want you to come out and do your magic and you know <laughs> and that's uh that's really what what um their focus is is that i come out as a professional uh, but i always try and communicate what the horse's body is telling me so they can adjust whatever they're doing either their training program or their tack or um mm. their approach like i was working with a small dog a few weeks ago and he's being fostered and he has terrible anxiety especially separation anxiety and um the owner was talking to me about how the husband was petting the dog and I said well this would actually really overwhelm the nervous system mm -hmm. the way you were petting him repeatedly like this I said it's much better if you just put your hand calmly on the dog and just leave it there and I said that allows him to just settle and she went home and told her husband and made such a big difference to this small little cutie so um so you know interesting. it really like teaching is part of that mm -hmm. wow i could have used you in some of my years with some of our uh pets that we've you know rescued and because i didn't know this was a thing i mean i guess i have heard of it vaguely before but um I don't know if how common this is, but it, it'd be nice to know because there's, I think a lot of animals would benefit, you know. Right. Um, and that's right. that's this is kind of an amazing. It sounds like a unique uh, skill. Do you know how common this is to have this kind of skill? Is this growing in popularity? I think people are becoming more and more aware of. Um, the energetic component of how their interaction with their animals, you know, affects them emotionally, mentally, and also physically. Uh, one of my plans is that um, I would like to teach people. So for next year, that's on the agenda for mm. creating classes, even online classes on how to just be more aware, how to tune in, how to how to read your animal and respond to to their needs on a much more intimate level so um, that we can maybe alleviate some of these stressors to then cause or influence their general health you know what can cause I mean stress is a big big um, factor in any of these chronic diseases I see so many animals that are anxious or that are having having anxiety issues that then ex are expressed by like constant licking or exactly you know, barking or things like that so um you know just for the owner to become a little bit more aware but i think i think people are just they're just more tuned in uh nowadays than even mm -hmm. 10 years ago so yeah wow um 
You know, what was, I was thinking what was interesting to me, something you said that your husband saw the cats, but he did not see his father because you said it was your father-in-law that came through. Correct. Yes. But he didn't see his father. I wonder no. why that is. It's interesting. Um, you know, I mean, every, everybody is on their own journey. So, you know, it, it, um, and we experience things in our own way, in our own time. And now, um, so it just sounds like you're very set. You have some sensitivities to the spirit world and, yes. um, you have been able, for whatever reason, you have been able to tune in and use your energy, your own energy for healing purposes for, mm -hmm. for animals. Have you ever found that you could do that for humans as well? Yes. Oh, okay. You just prefer animals, <laughs> prefer to work with animals. You know, they're less complicated, <laughs> but no, I, I've worked with uh, humans and I lead a circle for men and women where we discuss metaphysics. Um, oh, we do this monthly and we get together and we follow what's called the wheel of the year, which is following the natural flow of life um, throughout the seasons. And so right at this moment, you know, we're in October where nature kind of goes to sleep, so to speak. So we're talking about how that is expressed in our own life in, a, in, a, in an energetic way. How are we prepared for the lunar months? How are we prepared to surrender what no longer serves us? Just like the trees are dropping their leaves because they will no longer be needed. How is that showing up in our lives? So I do work with people I just yeah no I don't have a massage table although <laughs> I can't tell you how many how many times I get asked do you work on people I'm like you know I can but I prefer animals <laughs> so yeah just less complicated in that <laughs> but do you also get um these downloads of sort of information with when you when you have worked with humans, like you'll yes. sense, oh, this is the emotions you're going through right now. This is what you went through or something like that. Yeah. Oh, wow. absolutely. Yeah. And how do you for, I mean, it's, it would seem like this would take a toll on your energy. Like, is there a way for you to do like a cleansing and a rebalancing? Yeah. rebalancing? I spend an inordinate amount of time by myself. Um, luckily I have a husband who understands that, but I, in order for me to recharge, I spend a lot of time in nature. I spend a lot of time on my own. I don't watch TV. Very rarely do I watch TV. Um, I do not watch the news at all. <laughs> and, um, I eat very clean. I... I have to be very judicious in what goes into my body because my energy field is very sensitive. So even when I go out to a really good restaurant where I like to food, it sometimes doesn't sit well with me because the energetic input of whoever cooked the food or served wow. it, or, and even my husband has become very, very sensitive to that. So, cause we cook, I cook most everything that we eat. Um, you know, I, I make a lot of our own body care products. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it, there's, there's a lot of components, there's a lot of components yeah. that go into keeping my field as clean as possible. Um, so for instance, when I go grocery shopping afterwards, I typically have to take about an hour to just kind of clear things out again because i i pick up things and you know it it doesn't matter how much protection you put around your energetic field there's things that will just kind of come with you is is that also called empath an empathic person i i have empathic qualities but i would not consider myself an empath because I don't necessarily take on the emotions of others but i have very strong empath ethic qualities, I would consider myself more a highly sensitive person.
person. And I've always been like that from the time I was young. So it, you would describe, would you describe it as highly sensitive to picking up or reading others' energies? Is that how you would say it? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I'm, that I'm very good at at figuring out um, the energetic qualities of, of another person or animal um, outside of what is being said or being shown. Mm -hmm. And so if you wouldn't mind, you said that you also dabble in apothecary. Could you expand on that? Yeah, um, I, I'm in the process of enlarging that part of my business, but in essence, I make body butters and I make incense and I make anointing oils. Then recently I just made some Florida water, um, which state of Florida, <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically flower water and you use that to help clear your aura or your huh. energetic frequency. Um, it's a spray, it's lovely. And uh, so, you know, they're just whatever strikes my fancy. I'm in the process of figuring out how to make shampoo bars because I'm really fussy about what I put on my body. And, um, but yeah, I, I have fun with working with plant material. You make a third eye balm that people can use for meditation or lucid dream work or mm. just to help open the, the, third, eye, the third eye chakra. Okay, so, I need some of that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I, I want some of that. Yeah, I, my my um, personal, one of my personal interests is lucid dreaming and out of body uh, experiences. So anything that can help with that and learning about crystals now and <laughs> yeah, um, there's a whole nother rabbit hole, right? <laughs> yeah, there's so much. Um, there's so much to learn. Um, please, if you if you would in mind, like if if there's anything else experiences or otherwise that you feel like is on your heart that you wanted to share with the listeners who are interested in, you know, as you know, the metaphysical, supernatural, you know, all of this energy healing. Um, oh, and another question I had actually before you go there. Um, so I have an acquaintance who talk communicates with animals. Have you heard of that before? Like they're, they're somehow getting telepathic. Yes language yes. and yes. people who have been in the astral realm who have definitely talked to animals or shamanic journeys talking to animals have you experienced anything like that before i have i recently lost my horse he um mm. developed a neurological condition and so i have to say goodbye to him and oh. he came to me in a dream i astral travel all the time oh <laughs> woman you, you gotta you gotta share open up you're oh, there's you, just so much so um but um Valerie yeah, was, like, so, right, was like that too with the just kind of yeah you know I I it's it's very easy steps. for me to to journey um but uh it's um so you spoke with yeah, your, your I mean, horse who yeah. in a dream when they, right. from what I understand, if um, a loved one comes to you in a dream, it's probably not a dream. It's probably an actual right. visitation. Oh, no, this, this was lucid dreaming. And I was very aware mm. of that. And um, it, it was a very vivid, like, I typically when you dream, you don't always remember it. But this one was like, I remembered every aspect of it. Mm. So it was a very lucid dream. Uh, my sister-in-law, she is an animal communicator. She has wow. connected, and she also is a medium. So she's connected with my grandmother and, and uh, my mayor, who I lost several years ago. Uh, and a good friend of mine, she was the first animal communicator that I um, engaged. And I use her on a frequent basis to just check in with my animals because as, the, as an owner, you're somehow, you know, there's just that little bit of an agenda when you're trying to tune into your animals. So to have a third person mm -hmm. do it is almost kind of like a double check. 
And so um, a lot of the time she doesn't tell me anything I don't already know, but it's a nice confirmation that I'm, I am in tune with my animals. That makes so. sense. But I, I, if you wouldn't mind, I was curious to hear um, about the, your, the, your horse that you were sharing. Was that like a, hey, I'm okay? Was it a, like a, a goodbye? <laughs> Well, it was, it was interesting because um, the dream was about him being at a barn in a stall that I, 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 I realized like you shouldn't be in the stall because you're gone. Mm. And there were like grooming tools in the stall it was almost used for like storage, but he was there in the stall and he's like, I know, but I'm still here. Okay. So, um, and, and then he brought in another horse, a white, a white male horse, and his name is Francis. So um, the message was pretty clear that at some point in time, this horse is going to show up in my life. So, and uh, <laughs> I put out to the universe that I would like a little bit of a break. <laughs> okay. So, but we wait with the, with the delivery of another family member. <laughs> so. That's going to be, uh, so you, your expectation is that this is going to happen though. That's going to be amazing. You know, I don't really have an expectation. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I just have this inner knowing that, you know, after my horse passed, a lot of people asked me, are you going to get another horse? And I said, I don't even have to look because that horse is just going to show up like all the other animals in my life. They're just going to show up and I will just know. So, well, we have a few more minutes. Okay. I'm really curious if you could share maybe your techniques for going out of body and then maybe a one or two experiences, the type of experiences you might have. Mm, I don't know that there, there's necessarily a technique that I use um, because it's so easy for me to just leave. Uh, it's just a natural talent I have. I do make sure that I stay very grounded. So for me, it's very important that I am very aware that I am in this space, in this time, along with leaving. So mm. I make sure that I'm staying tethered to this world. Because a lot of the times when people journey, especially with plant medicine, we have, there's the risk to leave part of you behind. And so one of the mantras that I have uh, that I use regularly in my meditation work and my journey work at the end, I will repeatedly say, I call myself back from all places and all times. Because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we come back. You know, a lot of people are so fascinated with leaving and going to a different place, but the, the most important thing is that you also know how to come back and so I make sure that when I travel that I'm conscious of doing that that I'm conscious of making sure I'm tethered and I'm conscious of understanding that I have to come back to this body in this time and also that I don't get too enamored with the otherness. You know, it can be so cool to experience these, these have these different experiences, but to realize that it, that, it is, that it is a tool to grow as a human being and not to become too attached to, to the otherness to to want to leave constantly because a lot of people I notice are trying to escape the here and now and so they want to travel to other places they want to have different experiences they want to step out of their reality but 
in essence, we were brought here, we chose to come here, that's my belief system. We chose to come here into this body during this time to experience the here and now. And all of our other experiences through astral travel, dream work, however you wanna look at it, are, are there to broaden our horizons and expose us to different things that then allow us to be um, a more aware being. We're, we're a spiritual being having a human experience. And so many of us sometimes want to step out of having a human experience, but that's what we're here for. When did you start traveling out of body? That's a, that's a I'm not sure I have Consciously. An when you started realizing, oh, I'm traveling out of body. <laughs> Childhood um, or more into adulthood? Probably more into adulthood when I became really aware of it, but I've probably been doing that since I was a child. So, yeah. um, is it usually when you're uh, meditating or it through, through during your sleep cycles? I know a lot of people it's during the, you know, those sleep cycles when they're very relaxed, but they're kind of consciously aware of yeah, I, I always travel when I'm asleep. It's very rare that I'm that Oh, okay. I, yeah, I mean almost every night. But, but do you I I can I can astral travel when I'm wide awake. Like I can move like this. Oh, you can. And then your your would you say your physical body, you're able to just sort of um it's just be in a very relaxed place. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean I do I have talked to more than one person who actually was they were physically doing something like one person was driving it. Well, two, no, actually I know two people were driving a car and they went out of body, not trying to, but they happened to go out of body and they were aware of both doing both things at the same time, being in the physical driving. And then their consciousness was also somewhere else having a conversation. I think right. that's, I, th I think anytime you do something that does not require you, to engage your brain in the here and now, it can happen, yes. Mm -hmm. So like for instance, gardening, weeding, doing dishes, you, I mean, yes. you name it. anything repetitive. Um, exactly. You, you, can, you have the opportunity or the chance to travel. Um, I, try, I try not to do that because I want to also experience the here and now and stay grounded. Um, but for me, a lot of the times I can just sit somewhere and don't even have to close my eyes, but typically I close my eyes just to limit the sensory input. And then I can just go, but I, I have a very strong connection to different realms. So, um, mm. it, it's easy for me and to my guide. So, um, it's, yeah. Um, it's, you said something about your guides, your, um, in re in physical guide or astral guide uh, astral guides yes astral guides yeah. who who are who dwell in the non-physical yes okay mm -hmm. okay um would you mind sharing your meditation practice with us for me it's more important that Meditation to me isn't just about sitting on a cushion, but it's becoming quiet mentally. And because I'm a mentally very active person, I make a point of taking every opportunity I have to stay right here in this moment. So for instance, cooking for me is great. I love cooking, but it's also a practice for me to stay right here now. Am I chopping the carrot? Or am I off solving the world's problems? And so cooking for me, first of all, I can create something delicious, my body and, you know, my family. And also uh, it allows me to just really be present right now. And so meditation for me can be anything. It can be um, petting my cat and being really focused on that, or it can be weeding my garden, or it can be <coughs> cooking, it can be you know, even reading a book can be meditative. Uh, I don't tend to spend a lot of time on the cushion. It that's just doesn't speak to me. Um, it can be yoga practice where you're just really becoming aware of your breathing. 
or it can be 10 minutes of just sitting somewhere beautiful and watching the birds on my back, the back deck, for instance. Um, it's becoming aware of the, of the everyday moments. I find that to be much more effective than spending an hour on a cushion and trying not to scratch your nose. I, I, I you know, <laughs> I, I mean, it works for some people and good for them. That is a practice that they enjoy. It, that's just not me. I, yeah. It doesn't speak to me. No, what you're saying makes sense. I interviewed another person and she, um, uh, recently who she was talking about meditation mm-hmm. can be in, really an all day thing if you're present with whatever you're right. doing in that moment. That is a meditative, meditative practice, being present rather than your mind and your thoughts spinning off, dreaming, really daydreaming in a sense. Right. Why are you daydreaming rather than being present? Um, right. And I, that spoke to me, that made, that made sense. And, um, and, and it's been said that, you know, the more you do kind of train your consciousness like this, you will have more lucid dreaming and out of body experiences. So you don't have to force it. You, you know, I know that a lot of people, they, they're, like you said, that they're trying to um, have these experiences, but maybe first try to stay present in your waking life. It's interesting because I'm currently listening to an audiobook called The Practicing Mind, and it's very much about being present in the here and now. So for instance, when I work with an animal, I have to be very present. That's meditation right there for me to tune in, to be right here and right now and feel your way into into what is going on instead of thinking about it. Just being really there and feeling every moment and feel that shift in the energy, feel that shift in that pattern of tension. So, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. So I've really enjoyed this conversation. I feel like we barely touched the surface, but that's okay. That happens in these, in these (laughs) kind of short interviews, but I love, I've really enjoyed this. And again, I don't want to cut you off. If there's anything else you want to share um, or any projects you're working on that you want to share any, any, um, if you want listeners to connect with you, please let me know that. And I'll put links up as well in the description of the video. Yeah, I think uh, I think listening to these kind of interviews and just starting to open yourself up to that there is more to the world than what we can see and hear and um, taste and feel and touch. I I think people are much more open to it now, and I'm really happy about that because I I think it's only going to benefit us to become more aware. So I agree. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Daniela, <clears throat> uh, for sharing. And thank you, everyone, for watching. For watching. Uh, this has been Julie McVeigh with Unordinary Made Ordinary. And I do hope that you will join us next time for another fascinating interview. And if you did enjoy this um, interview, please give it a thumbs up. And then if you like this kind of content, please subscribe and then um, you can hit the bell icon and that will alert you to future videos. And I do hope you're having a wonderful day or evening wherever you are on the planet or off the planet. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye.